So let's get started. Um, I have a, a, a fresh GCP project that Ken created for me here called the TLC Core Sample Project. And um, at this point, it doesn't really have anything enabled. Um, I think he just added us as owners and that's that. And so as expected, we are starting with a fresh blank GCP project. Um, I'm gonna click over here and under the BigQuery menu, you'll see data form. Um, you might get a alert that this hasn't been enabled. I've seen that a couple times in the past. You just have to click yes and it'll turn on the service. But if you see this, this means that data form as a service is ready to go. Um, so we're going to create a repository in here. I'm going to go ahead and just call this test DF warehouse. Next, we need to pick a region. Um, I'm usually matching, I will say, the region that the majority of the data is located in. And I say majority because sometimes it can be split up, right? But if a client is East Coast, we'll probably go for one of the East Coast locations. Um, I have had clients who are, you know, bi-coastal, a lot of East Coast and West Coast US traffic. So um, sometimes they'll split the difference and do US Central, especially since, according to Google, at least, this is a lower CO2 option. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and just pick one of the East ones here. I'll go to Northern Virginia since that's close to me. Next, we need to decide um, the service account this runs in. Um, if you haven't used GCP pro before, um, this is a similar concept in a lot of uh, cloud services. The idea of a service account, um, you know, a service account is, is there to handle um, any server to server communication. You know, when I log in here as Brian Martin, it's not running this data form stuff as me. And it's not going to run it as you when you log in. It actually runs it as this non person account that it creates. Um, you're going to find that service accounts are used for. API connections, um, any, like I said, any sort of communication between servers or other computers. Um, and it makes sense, right? Uh, we don't want to uh, unnecessarily attach um, the things we do to specific people. The old hit by a bus, win the lottery rule, right? Somebody leaves the organization, we don't want to have to refactor this. So we have to create and decide what we want to actually run this as. Um, it gives you an option to run this as the default data form service account. You also have the option of creating one yourself and giving it the proper permissions and attacking it. Why would somebody want to do that? It is because if somebody knows your project project ID, they can guess what this, this service account email address is. You'll notice that even though this is a non-person account, there is still an email or a principal, as they call it, that's attached to it. But you'll notice that it's all in this G service account. Um, conceivably, somebody could pick this, and I've had some very paranoid clients who've demanded that we create just random gibberish service accounts to run something like this. For us, we're just going to do the default service account. Then we have just the standard question whenever you do anything in BigQuery, um, how do you want to handle the encryption? We're going to go with the Google Manage encryption key. Um, other than like federal government clients, I don't think I've ever touched any, anything outside that. Let's go ahead and create it. <clears throat> so at this point, we've created a data form repository on this project. Um, confusingly, it is telling us that we have created this one successfully and also given us the not quite an error message here. Um, what this is telling us is that I've created this repo, I've told it to use this service account, and that's happening. However, um, this thing uh, does not actually have any permissions yet. It, created the account for us and it attached it to the data form repo, but they are still relying on us to actually grant permissions to this account. I understand where they're coming from with this. Um, it does seem a little weird how automated a lot of this is. And then last month they're like, we're just making sure you know what permissions this user is getting. So um, we need to grant access to this user to do the stuff we need to do. Um, in our, um, Instructions, we have some options, and in the standard Google documentation, they'll tell you what roles to add. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually pop over in a new tab to this IAM and admin. Um, IAM is how you administer permissions and roles in a GCP project. Um, you can see here that in, in this one is just Penn and I as owners. Um, I'm going to click Grant Access. I'm going to paste in that email address that I just got, which has a 
period on the end. Um, you'll see that um, confusingly it has two of these, but if you ever type an email address into a principal here and it doesn't autofill like this, it means it's not a Google account and can't be used for something like this. Um, potentially it's been specifically denied those permissions, but um, I think you can select either one of those, but um, just to make sure you can see it, it, it kind of fills in as an entity and not just text that I pasted in there. Um, what roles do we need here? There is one off the bat that we need 100% of the time, and that is one called BigQuery uh, Job User. Um, this is going to be a necessary project level permission for any person or service account that you want to be able to do anything in BigQuery. It's already included in the owner role over here, so Ken and I don't need it. But this, this doesn't actually give you access to any data. This just allows you the right to request a query. This is allowing someone to come to the front door and knock and make a request. To actually get into the data though, we need to assign some sort of permissions to the data. Now, if you look at our instructions and then in the instructions of Google's official documentation, they will tell you to add at a project level, something like a BigQuery data editor role. This is a role that allows you to read and write and see the configuration of all existing and future data sets on your BigQuery um, database. If that gives you a bad feeling in your stomach, I don't blame you. Um, this is another one of those things where it really depends on the client and their appetite for managing this type of stuff. This will get the job done. You can get access to all the data you need. It also opens you up for some problems. I mean, this means this user has access to write and delete and override things like your GA4 source data. For a lot of my clients, this might do the trick on our development project, but when we go out to production, we might actually not even have this. We might just assign a BigQuery job user role at the permission at the project level, and then inside BigQuery, give them specific permissions to specific data sets. So the GA4 source data, you can only read that. You're only a viewer. But all the output data sets that we're putting all of our fun data form stuff in, you're a full blast editor on that. Do what you need to do. For today, now that I've done my, my disclaimer, and I will go ahead and save that. So if we go back here, we should be able to go into our repo and not see any errors like that. Great. Um, at this point, we've created a, I'll call it blank repo, and we got our service account configured so that it can work with all the data. And um, this is this is this is the front door for your your repo, right? And um, you'll notice we have tabs across here. Um, there are uh, settings related to um, things like GitHub, which we'll get into. The release and the scheduling is a way of uh, scheduling this stuff to be run or executed or compiled. We have workflow execution logs that show the results of those runs. And then we have this very special tab here called the development workspace. I understand why this, this was created, but um, Google's idea is that people who use this, especially a lot of, I think, data engineers, aren't necessarily software engineers and aren't used to creating something like a local development environment and the normal like software release process, right? So what they decided was to give you an editor built in um, to the actual data form process here, right? Um, I just initialized what they call a blank repo, but you can see it's it's like a text editor and has like a file manager and stuff like that. This thing is not hooked up to any source data. This is just a self-contained blank repo to kind of just show you the bare minimum of what a data form project looks like. What I usually do for my clients is this structure. Um, we still have a Google Cloud project that contains a data form repo, and that data form repo is outputting to BigQuery as before. The difference is that the source code we use is not stored directly in data form. It is gonna be stored in a third party Git st storage site, something like uh, GitHub 
or Bitbucket, whatever it is you want to use, right? And we would make changes to this GitHub repo, update it, and then the data form model itself would be updated as well. What that also means is it allows us to create a local development environment. I'm not going to get into this too much today, but when I develop uh, my data form projects, I develop them like I do any other cloud application. That is in a local development environment using resources from a Google Cloud project. Um, you can see now that I have this repo called Brian's DF Warehouse, and it's just under the organization that's associated with my username. Cool. Um, we're going to go back into our, um, our uh, data form repo. If you go under settings, you can connect with Git. Um, I would say SSH is most definitely a more secure method, but um, uh, for the sake of not having to walk everyone through SSH key connection today, happy to do it whenever, um, we're just going to do an HTTPS connection to get to this. So we need to paste in the Git repository URL. So I'm going to go back over to the, the um, repo I created, and you'll see under code, there's actually an HTTPS here. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to paste it in. Um, just like uh, his question, right? What branch name do we want to use? Um, I generally follow what is called the GitHub um, development process or a Git development process, in which case the main branch is your production release of your data. That means all of the work you do when you're developing it, those live in separate branches and you test them and you review them and you approve them hopefully. And then at some point they get merged into the main branch and then they get put out into this, this GitHub repo or this data form repo, right? But um, I will generally point this to the main branch. The, the, the only time that doesn't happen is if I have a client that has two projects, one is a development or staging and one is production, we might point to something like a staging branch if we want to test things in a production-esque environment. Um, for our sake, though, we're just pointing to the copy of the repo you made and we're pointing to the main branch. Now, obviously, this is a private branch in my private account. It is not publicly available. It does not care that Brian Martin is logged into this GCP project. I still need to tell it that I want to allow the access in. So we do that by creating a token in GitHub. This is going to be a large uh, chunk of text that um, we will use to um, allow access between uh, the GCP project and GitHub, right? Um, so I'm going to do this today on my personal account, and that's OK if you do it too. I will say I do this a lot when I'm developing with a client. At some point, though, you want to disconnect yourself from this, even if you're an employee of the company you're creating this for. Um, what I usually tell them is to create basically a service account in GitHub. Create a non-person account that is like even some random stuff that you created and use that account and whatever email address you have associated with it, maybe create like GitHub API account at your domain. Um, and use that to manage these. Um, there aren't any real service accounts in GitHub, but you can create an account on your organization that is not attached to a specific person and use that to do what I'm doing today. For today, for you, for me, let's just go ahead and attach these to our personal accounts. So this is actually something that isn't done on the repo. It is being done uh, under your personal account. Um, I am going to have to turn off my sharing here when I'm pasting in the code. But if you go under the settings and go into developer settings, you'll see this thing over here called personal access tokens. Um, there's classic tokens and there's fine grain. Um, ignore the beta, you want fine grain tokens, right? Um, these are a blunt instrument compared to the fine grain ones. Um, we're going to go in and generate a new token. So um, we are now going to create a new fine grain personal access token, or a PAT, if you'll hear it called. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call it something like uh, TLCDF token. Right? A lot of times you'll go in to this, and you won't see the organization, especially if you're like consultants like us. Um, so this does need to be enabled on a GitHub organization. So um, let me just go ahead and show you what I mean. 
Um, I'm going to just save that for 30 days. Um, we want to actually uh, allow access to a specific repository. So you can see that I have mine in there. It's BS Martin Brian's DF Warehouse, right? Um, if you go into this and you don't see the organization, if you're working with the company, they need to go into their security settings and allow it. And then they can actually require uh, approval as well. So um, just something to keep in mind. If you come in here and see, you know, 20 different ones, but not the one you're looking for, it means that GitHub organization that contains that repo needs to allow you in. Um, so permissions are gonna be at the repository level. Um, we don't actually need account access. We just are interested. Um, and in fact, the only thing we need are read and write access to the contents. There's a couple other dependencies that come along with this, but this will take care of it for you. Um, so that's what we're creating here. We're saying, uh, I want to create a token that is going to be spoofed as Brian Martin, and that token will allow me to read and write the contents of this particular repo. But going back to our linkage here, um, you know, we've entered the GitHub repository URL. We've pointed it to the main branch. Um, at this point, we've created a token. It's pointing to the repo that we forked, you know, Brian's DF warehouse. It has read and write access to the contents. And we have that saved. And I, I just copied it. Um, what we're going to do is enter that into what GCP calls a secret. It is essentially a password and important key management tool in GCP. Let's blank out here. We're just going to go create it gener uh, manually um, under the secret manager. Um, we're going to create a new secret. I'm going to call this DF warehouse. I'm going to call it GitHub token, right? Just so I know what this is. Um, and then um, you can see that you can actually upload a file if it's like a JSON key. For our sake, we're just going to paste in the value that I just copied from the token, right? Um, this is all going to be deleted shortly, so I don't mind doing this on a saved one. We might we might scrub this later, but um, you can see I pasted in that. Um, everything else um, I'm going to keep as is for now, but probably worth understanding about keyword management, or excuse me, secrets management and GCP. You know, you can require rotations. You can have it notify you when it's coming near an expiration. You can expire them, all sorts of great stuff. So I'm just gonna go ahead and create that secret. At this point, I've taken that GitHub token and I've put it into a secret with this name. So just starting over on this, we're gonna connect with Git over HTTPS, go to my URL, point to the main branch. And then there you go, there's the token we just created. So this is saying um, this URL repo, I'm going to the main branch, use this token to get in. Let's go. So what we need to do is go back into our token, or excuse me, our secret that we created here, um, which if you go, you can see here on the secret manager page. We go into that, we go into permissions, and we need to grant access to the secret. You can see Ken and I already have access because we're, you know, we're full owners, right? And we go in, I'm going to paste in that email, and then we need to give it the secret manager, secret accessor role. Just tell we're running out of things here. Cool. So at this point, the token's in there. Our service account that's running everything can access it. Refresh, though. It has been a little sticky at times for me. Cool. So. Let's go back to our development workspaces now. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna delete that one that we created. But you can see that we have uh, this repo created. It's pointing to the fork of the DF warehouse I created. There's the main, looks awesome, right? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and create a development workspace. Or two, for some reason. And then, we should be able to go in and hey, this already looks a lot larger than we had before, right? This is now a duplicate of the warehouse repo that I created here, right? So it's gonna have all of these files in there. It's created this linkage. If you browse it in here or in GitHub, um, you're gonna see a lot of the configuration stuff. But once again, definitions is where the magic happens.